Right, if there is a fire or an earthquake or an evacuation, Amanda at the top there by the desk, it's um, greeting everybody as she comes in, will take you through this door here down to the main assembly point. But we're not going to have those sort of problems, are we? No. No, we've all had enough of that. <laughs> um, the other thing is, that could everybody turn, make sure their cell phones are turned off, please? Um, sometimes the cell phone's left on and um, it's kind of a bit um, distracting. Um, I think we've just about got everybody here now, um, so we'll probably get this underway. As I said, my name is Julian Odering, and um, I'm 58 years old, and I have my own veggie garden. And um, apart from anything else, I love growing tomatoes, because tomatoes are a bit of a challenge. Has anybody had a bad run with tomatoes? Right, okay. Well, t well today we're going to talk, talk about the 101 of growing tomatoes. Like all living things, they need care and attention, and, um, and we're just going to make things as easy as possible for you. But after today, you shouldn't have any problems in growing tomatoes. If you do, you have to come and see me, okay? And we'll go over it. Because it's so important for me that you have success with that. Okay, when you talk about tomatoes, we're talking about different types. Um, we start off with these here. We have these um, in packs. We have them in pots. We have large, large, larger pots with... Um, um, sort of, what are they, cages, um, and baskets over here, and they're all different types. Oops, that keeps falling out. They're all different types. So you've got your bush, bush tomatoes, which this is a, a Russian red, which grows quite small as a bush. Um, last year we tried to get this one here in, but we had problems with MAF, it's called Big Boss. That's also a, a patio, like a, a bush tomato, and it's like a, bit, a beefsteak type, and it has massive big fruits. And again, all those there should probably have one stake in the bush tomatoes. Try not to grow them as this as, as a big bush because it's hard to get the light into them. So all your bush tomatoes, I would probably put one stake in at least. Um, as well as that, we've got the patio tomatoes. This one here is um, red robin, and we also have totem. And they actually just grow up on your, on your patio or on a, um, a deck, and they just, and you just pick the fruits as you need them. As well as that, a lot of people take these here. These are tumbling toms. And these are actually used, a lot of people take them on holiday with them, have them on their, outside their caravan. There's a yellow one and a red one. And just in case you need to know, the red one's always got the tank beside it. So that's your red and that's your yellow. And they have little small fruits like that, which a lot of people like to have in salads, you know, when they're on holiday and, and so on. And so, on. so, yeah, they're quite nice to take away. Um, and then on top of that, you've got your grafted tomatoes, which is what I like growing myself. That's these ones here, and we're going to talk about grafted tomatoes a bit later on. Um, but they are a, um, are a beast that require a lot more care and attention, but they give you a lot better yield. Okay, um, tomatoes. The one on one on growing tomatoes is you've got to give them what they like. Tomatoes love full sun. Now, does anybody know where North is? If you've got an analog watch, you put your 12 of your, of your watch towards the sun and north is always halfway between the small hand and the 12. That's the old boy, boy's brigade trick. Um, so they love full sun, they love heat. The next thing they love the most is food. They're big feeders. So you cannot give them, uh, you cannot not give them enough food to grow. And of course the most important thing is what we all need is water. They're big water lovers as well. The biggest complaints I have is with people not growing tomatoes successfully is that they don't grow them in full sun. I've, I've gone to pl people's places before and I've seen them growing under polythene houses and there's algae on the roof and it's all, all faded. Um, they've been in glass houses where it's, they've had whitewash on the roof. A bit of whitewash is okay, but tomatoes require virtually 90% of sunlight all the time. Um, the, other, the other problem that you have with them is that people grow them under trees. Um, or grow them under a, an eave of a garage, or I've even seen people growing them in the garage, and you just can't do that, because with a roof on, you, you've got to have lots and lots of light. Um, this time of year, of course, because we've got such a short season for growing tomatoes, you need to get them in right now. Um, because with tomatoes, um, they're, as I said, they're heat lovers, and they will perform best from now. If you put them in, so long as you don't get below four degrees, you should be okay for frost. Um, but four degrees is just a light touch of frost. And if you need to, just use paper. If you haven't got wee cloth, uh, sorry, not wee cloth, um, frost cloth, or microclimber, you can use just a bit of paper over the top of them. When I was a boy, we had to go out and cover all our plants with paper. And it took for 
ages. I used to finish sometimes at three o'clock in the morning before we've discovered frost cloth and a better way of doing things. Um, if, you, if you're growing uh, your tomatoes in a potting mix, I, another big problem I see with people is they don't use virgin potting mix. They use compost. And you'd never ever grow a tomato generally in compost. And the reason for that is one, compost is generally considered a soil conditioner. So what you do is you use that on clay soils or soils that, that, that have not got much structure to improve your structure. Sure enough, they've got some food, but they haven't got a lot of food. And the other reason why you shouldn't grow in compost is because a lot of compost comes from grass clippings and other garden material that has had been sprayed with weed killers or selective weed killers or so on. And what it takes is just a wee sniff of weed killer or wee sniff of the wrong chemical and these will start turning their toes up. And the good sign of um, being sprayed with a weed killer or having a touch of weed killer is the leaves become quite strapped. They go all funny, elongated um, and um, they, will, they will not make a good tomato. So when you're growing tomatoes in a, in a pot or a bag or whatever, you always use a virgin mix. And Odorings mix is the best. Okay. That's my recipe as well. <laughs> um, so the thing is that um, if you're also if you're growing in a glass house, a lot of people now this is a real switch away from the, the chemicals, and quite rightly so too. People say what's the best plant to comp compa companion plant with a tomato in a glass house, and I always say basil. Basil is really good because it, it, um, it does tend to deter the, the white fly especially and um, I've used it with success before as well. And the other thing is, of course, is um, marigolds are supposed to be quite good but the, generally the, the industry is moving away from harmful chemicals and it's going into more um, beneficial chemicals or beneficial things which are going to cause us problems later on. Or also bees, because the bees population apparently is dwindling quite a bit. So there's a lot of products out there which are going to be used, which you use for spraying. We'll talk about that a wee bit later on. Um, we're going to talk about grafted tomatoes. And the thing is that if, when you buy a grafted tomato, there's a few reasons why you do. A grafted tomato basically is... Oh, I've already done it here. Basically, you start off with a rootstock which is a rootstock basically is a very weedy, vigorous um, tomato. And if you let plant a rootstock by itself, it would grow probably about as high as the roof here and it would, before it fell over and it's got little wee fruits like that. No small fruits, very nondescript fruits and, and horrible to eat. But what the benefit of that is it's got a very vigorous root system. So what we do is we use the rootstock and we actually um, we use that rootstock to graft onto a sign, and which your signs are, are your normal ones, you know, like your money maker, potentate, sweet 100, tasty treats, and all those other sorts. And what happens back in the old days when we used to do a super tom or, or, or those sort of things, we used to do, an, uh, we used to put a tongue and groove cut into the middle, and the rootstock would s slot in, and 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 the way it would grow. But if you actually looked at those, and we put sellotape around them like that. But if you'd actually look at that, what would happen is the roots would start growing out and trying to find water because that graft was not really 100% um, secure. So in the end, you've got 75% of the sap, flow from, the sap flow from the rootstock coming into the sign. And you'd often see the roots hanging out of it, and that's the reason why. But with the mega toms, <coughs> the way it's done now, what we do is we do a 45 degree cut on the rootstock, and we put the sign straight on top, and we have a little plastic clip that goes over it. And then what we do then is when we do that graft, we cut the roots off. It's not as big as that at that time, of course. And then we put that in a germin germination chamber at 98 um, humidity and 20 degrees centigrade for 10 days. And what that does is that instead of growing a root system with only a few roots on it, it grows a lot more roots. And so as a result, that rootstock can take up more sap flow and more, more food up into the plant. And in that 10 days, that, that these roots start developing, and this here seals, and on the seal here, you get 100% of the sap flow coming straight through the rootstock up into the sign. So you're getting a lot better um, um, moisture um, and food coming straight up into the top of the plant. And that's the benefit of, of, um, of grafted tomatoes. Now the other thing about that is with the rootstock being the way it is, it's disease resistant 
and you get that disease resistance of from the rootstock coming into the top of the plant. So back in the old days when you had Phytophthora, uh, Verticillium wilt, Fusarium, some of those water, uh, soil borne fungi, uh, these are resistant to that. So a rootstock you can actually um, grow many times in the same place if you want to grow it in open ground, um, but you can, but the thing is with that is that um, these have, uh, I shouldn't get too technical, but you get um, Fusarium, Verticillium wilt, sometimes Phytophthora, which is your blights, and that sort of thing coming through, but because they're resistant to it, it makes these all resistant to it too. And um, also with a rootstock, with a rootstock being the way it is, you actually increase your real yield by up to three, to four, three times. Depends on how well you grow them, of course. But um, that's, the, that's the beauty about the megatoms. Um, right, so what I'm going to show you is how I do mine at home. You can, if you want to, use a pot. Can you see that all right? Can anybody see that okay? What I'd use is I use shrub and tub because I've only got a bit of room which is about six feet wide for growing my tomatoes. And I grow three tomatoes every year. And um, I use shrub and tub because that is a powerhouse of food. It's 100% bark and it's got eight month fertilizer in it. It's powered by Total Replenish, which is this. And basically, I, when the new people started, I planted one up, which is this one here, and I didn't look after it. But this here has not been fed at all since it was planted in August. And the thing is with that is, um, oh, we'll talk about it a bit later on, but basically what I've done is I've, the, the laterals have started up too high up in the plant. The laterals are much better to start lower in the plant, and I'll, I'll just explain that shortly. But anyway, I get my shrub and tub. I cut the top off it, like that. Blunt scissors. At down about sort of 50 mils. Don't forget what we're talking about. If you need to, wear a mask. I never do because if I wore a mask, I'd be looking like Frankenstein all the time around here because, because with our mixes, what we do is we buy the soil in fresh, we mix it fresh, we label our pellets, they go out and they're sold within one month. The problem with Legionnaires mostly, and this is how I feel about it, and that is that if, if you get that, you need to use it. If you use it on your house plants or your vegetable plants or anything else, use your whole bag. That's the reason why we sell them in 10 litres and 25 litres or 40 litres. But use a whole lot. The worst thing is to, is to partially use a bag, wrap it up tight and put it in your shed for about six months or whatever, then pull it out. That's when you get a build up of bacteria coming into that. So always, if you've got a weakened immune system, always wear a mask. So I get my bag of shrub and tub. I'm not going to wear it because I'm pretty tough anyway. So, And I thump that down about four times. And we want some drainage, so probably about 75 mils or 70 mils up from the bottom of the bag, I put some holes up. Okay, quite a few holes. And what that does is that creates a, a reservoir at the bottom because eventually these roots are going to get right down to the bottom of that bag and that way it's going to give you a bit of a, a, a water source to be able to, for your plants to be able to absorb that water that's at the bottom of the bag. Then I fold the top of this bag down. Now a grafted tomato is going to use at least 25 litres of soil to grow. It'll grow in more than that if you wish. But because I don't have the room, I just use one of these. Okay, then I spread that out. Then I get my tomato. In this case, it's a uh, money maker. Oh, I love money maker. They're such a good tomato. So easy to grow. And um, when you take your tomato out, turn it over like that. Gently tap it out, like so. Look at those roots. They're just waiting to get away into the soil, dying to get away into fresh soil. And you make a hole right in the middle of the bag, and, when you, and then you plant it in. Now it's really important when you plant this, and I want to show you this. Let's make sure I don't trip over everything here. That you plant the graft clear of the soil. If you plant that graft under the soil, because it has a wound in it, it could, it could um, be fatal to it. Not only that, you'll find that the roots, tomatoes would love water so much and food so much, those, those roots might start growing out of that. So you want to keep that clear of the soil when you're planting it. So that soil level should be down to here. Another, another reason why tomatoes, graft tomatoes fail, and um, 
is the reason that sometimes where the rootstock is, there's a lateral. And sometimes there's a rogue lateral comes up from there. And that has to be taken off, because otherwise what will happen, because it's rootstock, how it grows really big and vigorous, what will happen is that will grow and it will take all the nutrients from the sign and eventually it will kill the sign. So if you see any laterals coming from a rootstock, you must nip them off. Okay. And if you are cutting things back, don't use a pair of scissors. And you don't use a pair of scissors because when you use scissors, it, it bruises the, the, the plant. When you bruise the plant, you can get other bad things coming into it, which are in the air all the time, like botrytis and so on. You should use a razor blade like that, or a scalpel, or something very sharp when you're cutting your tomatoes, cutting your laterals. We'll discuss that soon. Anyway, so, with having that there like that, what that does is that gives you a good reservoir, because you're all busy people, and I know you are, what happens is, is in the morning, when you get up in the morning, you come out here and you fill that right to the top with water, and you, then you let, just let it drain right through, it'll drain right through to the bottom of the plant, of, of the bag, and that will give it enough water to sustain it for probably about two or three days. <coughs> as they get bigger though, you've got to water more regularly. So that's what I do with mine, I just get up in the morning, give them a good water right up to the top, let them go through. I generally water in the morning because one, that's when your tomato's going to put on a lot of growth, and also you don't want to keep the plant wet. So it's, it's, it's wanting to grow, it's wanting to um, ripen its fruit, it's going to want to do all, its, all, the, all those sorts of things. So basically you, you water it in the morning, and the other thing is that you don't generally water over the top with a hose. And if you don't water over the top with a hose, because that's where the water's going to be taken mostly in from the plant, so you do it um, on the soil. Um, okay, as your plant grows, Oh, one more thing that's really important. The first time I grew these like this, I had a disaster because I didn't, I didn't put some bricks at the bottom of it, and as it got bigger and bigger, then it fell over. So, I mean, you're not the only ones having disasters. So, so, <laughs> so when you do that, you need to get a brick or a block or something. Actually, I should get that one. I just use something like that. And I grow mine against the side of my house, facing north, and I put a brick like that just to wedge it in because this will get big. And as they grow, basically, you look for the best laterals, your strongest laterals, and try and take them from the bottom first. Not like this one here that's, that's put them up really high because I didn't look after it. Um, you take your strongest laterals from the base, and I take about four or five laterals. And those laterals will just start growing. And off those laterals, a bit like a, a, a Hebrew ca candle, basically I have them coming up and I have ropes coming from my gutter uh, just against my house and I, and I tie them up like that. But with those laterals that grow from here, I cut any laterals off those and just let the, the fruits grow. Do you understand what I'm talking about here or not? Okay, no, sure, sure. I might just butcher this thing. Um, because that should come off anyway. So say for argument's sake, that's coming off the side of here, okay? So that basically a lateral is, is a vegetative part of your tomato. So, so that there is a lateral. See, it's coming from, that's your natural leaf, that's your lateral coming out from the centre, okay? This is a lateral coming out, now that's a strong leader. So that's what you want. Say if that was your main tomato coming up, you'd want to keep that one if it was down low, because that's going to be a strong leader. These ones here are a, lot, are a lot thinner, so those ones generally would come off if they're down the base of the plant. If, if they're down the base of the plant, but you want to set your laterals by the time your plant's about that high. You need to have your laterals coming up now. As your laterals come up, generally, like say if that's one of the laterals that's coming off the plant, you're going to keep about four or five of those coming up like that. Then you take the laterals out of the one, the leaders that are coming up out of those out of those laterals. So, for argument's sake, that there's coming up like that. What you want to do is take these laterals here out. Um, not, not off the pieces that come off the side. I, I, want, I want five or six main laterals coming off the main plant, yeah. like that, but of those laterals that come up off the main plant, plant that spray, spray out, that's when you take the, the, the laterals off, off the laterals. Right, okay. Do you understand that? Yeah, well, 
Yeah, no, because it's pretty, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty involved, I suppose. But yeah, so basically what would happen is that as it grows, then you take these other, so that's the lateral off the main, then you take the laterals off the laterals. So basically you take those off. The other thing you can do, which is not a bad idea, because tomatoes need light, as I said before. So as your, as your laterals are growing, sometimes they get very, very leafy. So you can actually just cut those leaves off by half. Especially when you're facing the sun, because you want to get that sunlight in to ripen the fruit. And sometimes it looks really, really bulky and you can't get enough light in, so you can actually cut those leaves back by half to let the sun shine in to, to ripen the fruit. And when you do cut that back, this is a problem that a lot of people have. They cut them back like that and they, and they, and they bruise or damage the plant when they're doing That's why you must use a sharp knife and, and that way it will calcify and prevent disease from getting in there like botrytis or you know, those other sort of things. With your tomatoes, um, generally this time of year there should be some bees coming around. They should do the fertilising or uh, the pollination for you for your flowers. If it was a lot earlier in the winter time, you'd have, to, you'd have trouble trying to do it. And sometimes... If you, if you don't see any bees, you can do this, but if you're in a, um, in a glass house, you have to ventilate your, your, your tomatoes because otherwise the bees won't be able to get in there to do it. And you can't even got the wind movement in a greenhouse either. So if you are growing your tomatoes in a greenhouse, give as much ventilation as you possibly can during the day now. And then um, the good thing about a greenhouse is you can get started a lot earlier with tomatoes. But uh, greenhouses, just again, just check so you've got plenty of light. So that's coming up off, that's a lateral off your main stem and then you cut the laterals off the laterals. Yeah. Um, I started half a dozen tomatoes in my greenhouse uh, about two months ago. And yeah. They're just in pots now. Um, I can take them out of that greenhouse and put them in bags outside soon. And dig them out of the ground? No, they're not in the ground, they're in pots. Oh the yes, greenhouse. absolutely, yep. So yep. I can take them out soon, maybe even now this weekend and put them in yes, bags. Yes, absolutely. And, and I'm glad you're doing that, mention that, because it's really good if you've got a greenhouse to get an early start on your tomatoes like that. Yeah. Like I say, Christchurch conditions are very, very, um, um, tight for growing peppers, more so peppers than tomatoes, but tomatoes are so vigorous so they can actually give you a good yield right up through the end of March, basically. But peppers, of course, need a really good soil as well, and generally if you've got peppers, start in your greenhouses really early at the same time. You've got sort of bird's eyes, habaneros, um, some chilli peppers, some other bell peppers. Yeah, good one, you like the hot stuff. Yeah, I don't want them actually. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll have questions at the end, end of the, the thing anyway, guys. So if, you've got, if I'm talking too fast, I mean, you can ask the old question. But, but basically, then your tomato will grow, and at that time, you start tying it. And as I said, I have one against the side of my house facing north. I have a, a board tied to my gutter, and I have about 15 strings hang down. And with those strings, you can use this stuff here, which, is, which doesn't damage your, your plants too much. Hang on. Probably shouldn't use it now, I've got to pay for it. Who wants to buy this for half price? <laughs> <laughs> you can have these coming down that they're elastic, but they'll only last one year. So you, you, you have them coming down and you're, and you're, and you're no, she's going a bit difficult. Janet, can you give us a hand please? This is Janet by the way, Janet's the one who does all our graft and I should have introduced you to the, everybody. Hold that please. So. There's several ways of tying up. You need to have it coming down from, from, the, from the top, and this is really quite good. And then you just wrap it around like so. It's a bit difficult because we're doing it that way. And then, hold that please, Janet. Jeez. And you just tie it at the base. Just put a simple granny knot on. Like so. But generally, as I said, this, because this only lasts for about one year, that's about it. And when you do tie it, don't tie it too tight, because this is still thickening up and it's still growing, so you don't want to restrict it, otherwise you could ring bark it. And then you can use ties, twist some ties like this, and if you do, just bend it over like that. This is what I, actually, I cheat. We've got a tape gun here, and I use that. I can't tell why. And you just give it plenty of room, like about that much room, and you twist it round. We'll just keep this here so you can have a look at it anyway. Don't crush the, the, um, the stem between your fingers, and I'll just leave it like that. And generally, that, that won't, if it does slip down, it'll just slip down to the next um, leaf or around there. Thanks. Hang on. It's quarter price now, so <laughs> just show that around everybody if you want. The other thing, actually, I use twine because I use it um, several times. 
and it lasts a lot longer. So I use a twine and I um, tie, it, tie it like, like that. Um, the good thing about planting in this is I leave these until they all finish fruiting and then after that I just cut the tomato off and I discard it. But because I've got dogs in my backyard, I use this um, next spring and I use this for preparing my lawn. I also have used it for putting, putting in the bottom of my tyres for putting potatoes in as well. It's all still good, still good mix and it's still got some stuff in it. As I said, when you plant this in here, you won't have to feed that. If you plant that now, you won't have to feed that until December. That is, as I say, that is an absolute powerhouse of food. It's virgin mix, it's pH adjusted, it's got everything it needs in it from, um, from um, not rain crystals, from a wetting agent through to everything it needs. Um, as your plant's growing, you're going to get, because all living things are like that, you're going to get pests and diseases. Um, with mine, I just leave it until December. It's usually good until then because there's not too many pests around, unless you've had a very mild winter like we have this year. Uh, so you might get a lot of things like aphids, whitefly, um, looper caterpillars are a problem. Um, and for that, we've got a whole range of things. I've just thought about something here. Um, so basically, we're trying to protect the, the, the bees now, so liquid copper is, is, is one of the best fungicide and um, bistriticides out. Use that, because it's, it's very gentle on insects, gentle on bees, gentle on everything. You can, it's, there's no withholding period, you can actually use it all the time. A new product that we've got out, which I'm still learning about, because every time I see a customer, I say, oh, come, oh. I oh, know, don't stop it anymore. There's been so many things being taken off the shelves because um, of registration problems. This is a new product called Deem. And what is this? Dimaceous earth, which is like a, a crushed up fossilised um, fossilised shells, and neem oil. And what it does is it's, uh, is it's a natural um, bug killer and also a fungicide. So it's again effective against mildews, rusts, leaf spot, blight. Now, blight is phytophthora, and sometimes. As I said before, if you're not careful and you damage this here, you can get a blight coming there, which is Phytophthora is a, is a, is a, um, a fungal spore which could actually kill the plant. So um, this here, you just spray it on, it's a contact. How do you like the sound effects? Pretty good, aren't they? So it's a fungicide applied on a weekly schedule. I haven't used it myself, but I'm going to try it this year to see how we go. Um, as well as that, you've got the other old tried and true ones such as Maverick, if you've got a real infestation, which you shouldn't have, if you actually keep an eye on these, and this is the thing, when you've got a tomato, you've got to keep an eye on them. Um, this is also an old favourite for an um, insecticide. Kills caterpillars, aphids, thrips, mites, whitefly, psyllid. Now, the problem is we haven't talked about psyllid yet, but psyllid is a little beast of a thing, and it came into the country probably about five or six years ago, I think it might even be longer than that, but it affects all the selenium crops. So it will affect tomatoes and potatoes. And what it does is a little wee, little wee insect, and you can see it underneath the leaf, and you know you've got it, because it looks like icing sugar, if you've got it. And um, that's a real pain, because it is one, I think one every 100,000 it contains a bacterium which will kill your potatoes or your tomatoes. And so you've got to watch out for that. If you're going to go completely the other way, you, there, there is a micro screen that you can actually put around your, your tomatoes if you want to as well, which will stop everything getting to, including the bees. So I don't know how you go with pollination if that's the case. Um, so there's a wide range of things. As I said, with feed, when you want to feed, if you use a liquid food, don't forget liquid feeds are very good because they're very fine and the plant takes them up very quickly and very easily, but they also dissipate a lot faster. Um, with your solid foods, they take a bit longer to become active, but once they're active, they, stay, they, they last a lot longer in the soil. This is tomato feed. Um, the other problems you can get um, are blossom end rot. Does anybody know what blossom end rot is? Okay, blossom end rot generally is caused by not enough calcium and possibly too much, too much um, phosphorus, uh, potassium, no, potassium in your mix. Now the thing is, that's the other reason why you should water your tomatoes in the morning because that's when the plant wants to take up that water. And if you, the, 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 what I've found with my tomatoes, when I've had blossoming and rot, it's because they've wilted. And because they've wilted, the plant hasn't been able to get that calcium and boron and all those trace elements up to the top of it. And that's when you get that blossoming rot because it, ha because it hasn't had enough calcium. So all these mixes here have got gypsum in. But gypsum is a marvelous thing because gypsum um, adds calcium to, to the plant without affecting the pH. 
Other problems with tomatoes are physiological, and a physiological hides a range of sins from, um, as I say, um, scarring on the fruits, which is usually caused by that um, when the, uh, if you've watered probably in the heat of the day, it's had a big rush of um, water up into the fruit and it's split it, and that, that, can, that can be caused by that. With tomatoes, they all like a good watering. That's why I say water, it's saturated, and let it dry right back a bit. As I said, those roots will be at the bottom there very soon. So um, this little reservoir here is really, really quite, quite good. The problem that you have is we're coming up to Christmas. Who goes away at Christmas? So who's looking after your tomatoes? They're like a baby or an orphan. So they need to be looked after. Um, there's a watering system down there. It's probably, a, I don't know how much it is, but... The thing is, if you are if you are going away, it's a good idea to get your neighbour. If you get on well with your neighbour or you've got um, family still home, get somebody to look after them because you put all that work and effort into it. Be ashamed to see it all go for nothing. Because that's when a lot of people do lose them when they go on holiday and they come back and they've and they've all sort of dried out. Because you should be getting good fruit off it by the time you go on holiday. Okay, what's the time? Okay. Just very much aware of the time because we need to have a question and answer thing very shortly. Um, Janet, do you got anything to mention? No? Okay. Um, so we drink one, just think of anything else. Are there any questions so far? Yes? Actually, there's been a lot of work done on, on milk powders and that sort of thing, because milk powders are supposed to be quite good for um, fungal diseases as well. I'm actually, within the process, I, I, I got some given to me, but I haven't done anything about it yet, but we had a, like a milk powder, which they're actually using as a fungal sort of disease. Or, as I say, a lot of the, the, the focus nowadays is getting away from the bad sprays and getting into more natural sort of things, which is, which is a good thing, you know, because, um, but yes, certainly I have heard something like that. But like everything else, you could probably pee on this a couple of times, but I wouldn't do it all the time. So, <laughs> and you pee, you got ammonium. And, and have you ever seen the, far, the world's fastest Indian? He's quite right. If you pee on a lemon tree, it's beneficial to it, but only when the lemon tree is wanting to grow. Most of the nitrogen-based fertilisers are urea-based, which is cow's pee. And the thing is, if you put it on the on, in the winter time, what will happen? Because it's not wanting to grow, it's going to become toxic to the plant. So in the summertime, when it's wanting to grow, that's when you can feed more. And the good thing about Total Replenish, it's got a quick release fertilizer on it and a slow release, uh, and a, sorry, and a controlled release fertilizer on it. So there's a quick release to the plant straight away for it to keep growing, and then the controlled release imbibes water and then it releases it back to the plant depending on temperature. Oh, good point. Yes, you can, but if you plant, yes, yes, you can, but you don't need it in here. But if you're putting it in the garden, you incorporate it in the soil because, yes. Our most common um, element in our, in our air is nitrogen. And nitrogen, if you don't put it in the, in the soil, it tends to dissipate quite quickly out to the, sea, to, to the air. But this here, once it's in the soil, you mix it in with the soil, and that is, um, it locks in the nutrients to the plant. Yes? Yes and no. Um, the, the biggest complaint that we've had with um, your, the likes of your seaweeds, if you're doing it yourself, you have to drain all that um, sodium, Na sodium, out of it because sodium is toxic to plants in high, in high doses. Um, but thanks for mentioning that because we do have a liquid seaweed here. And the good thing about that is a tonic. What it does, how can I explain it? Mm. It's like us taking vitamin C. And what happens is that we put the trials in with seaweed-based products and what it did is it strengthened the cell walls of the plant to the extent that a lot of bugs didn't like um, sucking into them, which is really quite good. It's a good time for the plant, it boosts its immunity, and it makes it so that insects find it harder to, to damage it. Yep, blood and bone's fine if the cats or the rats or the mice haven't got into it. <laughs> or your dog, yeah, they love it, don't they? Yeah. The thing with blood and bone is though, just watch out because um, like all those powder things, they sometimes get water in them and they go hard, but no, no it should be right. Um, blood and bone's a good source of iron and um, nitrogen as well. Yes? With those sprays that you've been showing here, um, I've tried to 
grow as organically as possible and not use anything at, at all. Yep. Are they organically? Um, oh. Yeah, the likes of Maverick and they. Uh, yeah, no, no, they're not. This one here is supposed to be the closest you get to it. Right. What about neem oil? Is that? Neem oil is off, a off the neem tree, yes. Yeah. But and does that sort of um, protect you against most of the, the likes of um, white fly and yep. blight? Does. And that, and Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, because that's what I use on mine only. I only use Wally's Secret Tomato Feed. Because right. what that does is that feeds the plant and it also um, detracts insects such as especially white fly, aphids and so on right. from getting to it. It's supposed to do the same for, for caterpillars, but I, I didn't probably use enough of it, but I got um, loop of caterpillars on mine. Right. And if you're organic, just go around and squish them. Oh, yes, yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> Have you got the time? Is, is potting the mix an effective unit to grow likes of anything in tomatoes and that sort of thing, potting mixes absolutely as i said before if i was growing um peppers tomatoes those sort of things you've got to do within a certain time frame you use a really good potting mix right okay and um the thing is that um peppers because peppers are more um affected by colder temperatures you need to get those started really early and i try over here in our nursery to get them started really early but they all seem to sell out and now we're into the smaller ones again but because you've only got a short window for growing the peppers. Um, you've got a better window for growing tomatoes, but if you're growing peppers, always grow them in a really good potting mix, in my opinion, in, in the hottest conditions you can. Now, you were talking about the laterals that come off that plant there. Yep. Is that a grafted one, isn't it? That's a grafted, yes. What about, I've got um, half a dozen uh, Russian reds at home, and I've got one of them planted at the present time. I've kept the others in yep. little um, hot hothouse. Yep. Um, with those laterals, they okay to keep some of those laterals off? Um, with Russian red, I would actually stake it, yes. put one, one stake in, and I would actually see if it, if it puts out so many laterals that your, your fruit's not ripened, I'd be cutting some of those laterals yeah, off. Yes, yeah, I cut most yep. of them off. But yep. When it gets that's to right. the, yep. the top of the plant, I'd only let two or three. Yes, that, that's fine. Yes. Yep. I, I, if you can leave it, it's, it's, it's a food numbers game. So if you've got plenty of food, right. and you've got, they're putting on the growth, try and leave as many, because the more laterals you have, the more fruit you get. Yep. Just a little point about, you mentioned putting paper over top of the plants there earlier on. Um, I have found over the years that if you tend to think that you might, be, uh, might get damage from frost, I just generally go and wash it off with a, it just hose, hose the plant down. Yeah, you can. Don't forget, at certain times of the year, depending on what time you're doing it, um, the intensity of the frost is not as much now as it was earlier on. So, so the frost usually is lighter and it goes off quicker. But if you had this outside, say, in um, August, and you had a very cold spell like hail or something like that, um, you might not get to it in time. No. That's why it's peace of mind. If you have a piece of paper, just... Yeah, break it through there. Yeah. Oh, good idea. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Yeah, sure, yeah. But, um, yeah, no, that's a good idea. Anything, basically, there's all sorts of ways of growing these. It's just whatever way you find it best. I'm just trying to give you some, some helpful hints on how I do mine. And I'll tell you what, once you start getting the fruits off them and you're picking them every day, it's absolutely so rewarding. And, um, um, I probably, I mean, it'd probably be, how many years I've grown now? About five, six years. Um, but I, it's a challenge to me. It's always a challenge because you've always got to be working on them and just making sure they're okay. Whatever you do, don't put a tomato and expect it to just do its thing. It, it, it will try to fruit, it will try to succeed, it will try to um, grow, but the thing is that there's other elements against it all the time. So you've got to treat them with a lot of care. Yes, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, sorry what, what's the question again? Hard pieces, the, the, the skin you're talking about. Oh, I'm not sure the, what the question is. Um, I think the lady's saying, why is it not ripen up to the top of the tomato properly? 
Only thing I could put it down to would be um, maybe a light problem or a water problem. I'm, I'm not sure of which um, particular thing you're talking about, but uh, uh, but tomatoes do need light to ripen properly. Whether whether or not it had something covering it so so it wasn't ripening up properly, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. Sorry. <laughs> How much time have I got? Big picture, big picture though. Like, what do you do at the end of the season? What do you do, uh, like a timeline on how you manage each year? Okay, I can tell you about my timeline. Um, what we do is these tomatoes are available. Uh, the, the question is, he wants to know a timeline of um, how we do the tomatoes from growing, sowing, growing, grafting, to, right to the finish. Basically, our tomatoes, we start sowing those in around about June. And um, we do an early crop of, um, uh, of grafted tomatoes because we've got North Island garden centres. And we do those and we put those in June, July into um, pots and we grow them in the hoop house. Um, then with the home garden, we say about that time, around about July, you're okay to put them in heated greenhouses only because you still get really hard frost through July, August, September. And so from heated glass houses from July, then you go into just glass houses from around about August, August to mid-August. And then from around about October, you're okay to put them outside if you look after them. That's basically a rule of thumb. Um, and if you put them outside, be prepared to cover them. Because as I said, you, you're starting off with such a short window anyway, so the sooner you get onto them, the better if you can look after them. And of course, they, start, they will start fruiting around about... Um, November, even probably a bit earlier, the earlier crop ones will if you plant, if you plant them in a greenhouse and um, they will fruit right through until about the end of March. And at, at that time, at the end of March, basically what you do is um, if you're growing them in a bag like this, I just cut it off at the, at the bottom and I discard that, throw it in the, in the compost heap. And um, with the soil, I use that in my, uh, to, to plant my potatoes in, or I use it to prepare my lawn in the, in the, um, the, the following spring. I just leave it there over winter. Um, does that answer your question pretty much or not? Yeah, we're, we're planting in the garden, so we don't have the bags. So do you do anything like put straw over the top of an open garden? Or no, absolutely not. Okay. No. Thanks for mentioning that, because a, a gentleman came to me and he said, hey, look, I'm, I don't like your tomatoes, they're crap. And I said, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> You sure they brought them from us? Um, so I went around to have a look at his garden because it means a lot for me for people to be successful. And so hopefully you're all successful after this, otherwise I'm going to be a very busy man. But um, so I went around to his garden and he had pea straw that he put over the top of them. And sometimes when they're using pea straw, they use a, 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 a weed killer to, to knock it down. And that weed killer off that pea straw, just with leaching through the ground, was enough to make them all distorted. And I said, this is what you're doing wrong. He said, no, I'm not. I said, yes, you are. <laughs> no, I'm not yes, you are. Anyway, so I said, I'll give you some more and try the pea straw. And he did it, fantastic. And all it takes is a sniff, and I've done it myself, because I've been out with a weed kill, and I think, oh, I've got tomatoes here, and over there, and I'll just go way over here. And you know, they got it. And the thing is that when you get it, you'll know, because they'll go all distorted and strappy and thin. And so if you're weed killing around your tomatoes, do it on a very, very still day. And if you can, put something around them to protect them. But thanks for that, about the pea straw. I wouldn't use pea straw around tomatoes. You're talking about repetitive planting of tomatoes in the same bit of ground. If you're doing um, your open pollinate tomatoes, like that, probably two to three years maybe. Um, but if you're using the grafted tomatoes, you can plant them every year because you can repeat plant grafted tomatoes and then because they are, they don't, they're, they're resistant to all those types of diseases that you might get um, through uh, uh, repetitive planting. So is there oh, a way sorry. to sterilise the soil? like in a greenhouse? There is a product now that we've got. Um, back in the bad old days, we used to use bromide, and then we used to use basimid, and they took that off the market. But there is a product now, and have we got a retailer here today? Is Mandy still here? There is, there is another product that's come out, because I've taken Jay's Fluid off the market as well, and um, which is a bit surprising to me, because Jay's Fluid was quite a good sterilant. But um, yes, there is a product there. And I asked one of the ladies in the shop because I know they've just bought something else out which is supposed to be quite good for sterilising soil. Yes. 
I'm sorry if I'm not going to get round it, but I'll, I'll come back to you in a sec. <coughs> We've got a lot of uh, gardeners in here today, obviously. Yes. And when the council start calling for res um, uh, water restrictions, mm. what I've done over the last winter in particular is I'll stand my wheelbarrow up and it gets full up when it's a really, you know, you get two or three days of rain, the, the, mm. my wheelbarrow gets full. Now I've got about 15, 20 litre buckets at home full of rainwater. So when it comes to restriction time, I just use my watering can, the water the garden. Good idea. Now the other thing I want to know about that is that the, some of them are starting to go a wee bit green. The, the buckets of water are starting to green off a wee bit. Will that affect the usefulness of the water? No, it won't. But if, if you want a word of advice, put some black polythene over the top and it'll stop the, 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 the what's growing in there, the algaes and stuff growing in there. Oh, put a bit of a black polythene over the top and it'll just keep, it, keep your water nice and fresh. Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you, 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 sorry. <laughs> Uh, your total replenish is enough by itself. Sorry? You wouldn't need to use the potting mix and that. No, that's all you need if you're growing on open ground. And, and a bit of lime or gypsum, just to bring you, you know, for calcium. I don't know, when you grow on open ground, you don't know what, what sort of structure you've got in the, in the way of foods and um, pH and all that sort of stuff. Because pH is, pH is very important to a vegetable plant. Most vegetables like a pH of about 6.2 to 6.4. And our water is seven. So when you're watering your garden, you're actually increasing your pH anyway. And the thing is with your pH, it's like, to a plant, it's like you're having um, uh, gastroenteritis and you're hungry, but you can't eat. If, so if your pH isn't favorable to your plant, like say if you had a pH of about 4.5 or something very, very low, your plant won't be able to absorb the nutrients that it needs that's in the ground. So, you, so pH is very important to a plant. So. If you're not, if you if you if you had a bad run of growing tomatoes in open ground, you need to look at your soils because your soil is telling you something. Okay, your soil is a lifeblood. That's what's called the media because it's a carrier of for your plant. Yes, yes, but we do we do. If you, if I have offered um, customers that have continuous problems with say blueberries, that, and usually the main problem with that again the pH has been too high. They like a low pH. They're an acid loving plant. But yes, we, we can do it. If you're having continuous problems, yes. Um, with the shrubbing tub, when I take that home, and that's going to feed till December, am I able to obviously give them an extra boost with some sea salt or the thrive tomato or something, or I don't need to until after December when the fertiliser's done its job? Thank you for, thank you for asking that. Um, that, that is, um, the question was, because I'm not sure you can hear that on there, but um, do you have to give these any extra boost or whatever while your tomatoes are growing? Your tomato is an indicator. And when your tomatoes start starving, these lower leaves are going to go yellow. And that is your indicator that they're saying, hey, I'm hungry. Because what happens is the top of that tomato takes the nutrients from the base of the tomato. And so when your tomato starts starving at the bottom, it starts going yellow, that's when you start putting your food on. Yeah. Does that answer your question, sir? Good. Actually, there's a lot of things to mention, isn't there? Thanks for all these questions, because there's things I've been to say, but I've forgotten. Yes. Why? Oh, you, you can put straw on top, but if you put newspaper on top, what you're doing is you're actually making your ground sour. It depends, if you put a lot of newspaper on... No, okay, right, because cause what happens is, you, is your ground needs to breathe. And um, when people put um, plastic or weed matting over your ground and then they go to plant into it, because it, it becomes quite sour, they, they don't usually have such a good run with plants. But, but um, Straw would be okay, and you can actually, um, so long as you, if you're planting these, just watch out where you get your straw, pea straw from. Mm. <coughs> yeah. I don't think all people do it, but the place this guy got it from, um, he it certainly had weed killer in it, and they must have used that for making it die down a bit faster. Anything like a woody weed killer, what you spray your lawns for to um, for kill broadleaves in, they don't like it. They don't like Roundup, they don't like any of those herbicides. So please, I can't emphasize enough to you, do not have those, touch those plants. Okay. Yes, ma'am. With all of these tomato food, how often would you use that? Oh, 
Oh yes, I'd probably put that on once every, I use about a teaspoon, sprinkle over the top. Um, probably about every four weeks. Yeah. If your plants grow really, really strongly, it will tell you and you put on a wee bit more. Now apparently it does, it does control um, caterpillars as well. And Wally Richards sometimes come and does talk on his products too. No, no, I just plant it like that for now. I use that from around about December. And the good thing about it is it's two things. It's a feed, and it's quite a very good feed because it's high in potash and less high in nitrogen. If you use a, a feed that's high in nitrogen, what's going to happen, this is going to go poof. Your potash c creates a more stronger, tougher plant. And, and potash, you can see potash in the plant because it goes more darker green. And that's what you want to want. You want strong plants. Nitrogen produces, produces lush green foliage, but you don't want lush green foliage sitting in the ceiling. You want to keep your plant controlled. What about Epsom salts? Would you use those on plants? Probably not. That's magnesium sulfate, isn't it? Is it magnesium sulfate? Yeah. Um, I'd use it on Daphne and I'd use it on some of your citrus loving and acid loving plants, but not on these. These are not acid loving plants. Yes, ma'am. Were they looper caterpillars? Did they arch their back, or what sort of caterpillars were they? No, They're what, sorry? Horny. Not horny. <laughs> <laughs> well, Success Natural Light is supposed to be very, very good for um, for caterpillars, so you could use that. But again, if you're using those sort of those sorts of things, try not to spray the time when when the bumblebees are out. But that would that would kill them. Otherwise, pick them off. It's good fun. Yeah. Squeeze them. There we go. Yeah, I'd like now. <laughs> I'm sorry if I don't get around everybody, but... You can tell when your cat pulls are there because the leaves have been here. Yeah, that's right. It looks like somebody's got a shot going on. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, um, if you use something like toothpicks on your lawn, how soon can you start using that as a mulch? That is a good question. I'm not sure how long it's, is that dicamba or two four five tea or something. Oh, no, it's not, it's not like that. It isn't. Oh. Two fix. I, I'm not familiar with that, but I'd have I'd have to have a look for you. But um, but that's the reason why a lot of those things are being are being banned or being taken off the market. Because as you know, when you put your green bin out, it goes out to living earth, is it? And they and they turn into compost, and and then they try to avoid a lot of those residual um, residual um, herbicides coming into the into the garden scene. Yeah, that's why they're doing that. Um, but I'm not sure how long how long that will last in the compost. But everything eventually, through leaching with water or whatever, would, would get rid of that. But again, um, I, I'm just saying about these here, they just don't like anything. Yeah. Yes. Would the neem oil fix that lady's caterpillar trouble? Yes, apparently. Yeah. Yep. Neem oil is quite good and it's quite natural. So that that like I said, I didn't have that. I didn't have that with mine, but Janine, you know Janine? She's our manager here. Speak to her about it. She says it controlled her caterpillars. I'm not sure about the horn ones, though. <laughs> Has it got horns? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, well, mm. sorry, I, I, I'm not familiar with that caterpillar. Yes. So, what is the actual difference of growing in a bag and pot? No, no difference, okay. no difference. Because you already got this, yeah. you might as well use it. That's my point. Yeah. And, and that's 25 litres. You can grow it in a pot if you wish. If you, want to put in a, if you want to put in a smaller pot, you can put in a smaller pot. But just chop the bottom of the pot out so, and put it on your ground so it can probably take out the extra nutrients out of your ground if you wanted to. The good thing about growing the open, in the open ground is that when you go on holiday, it's got more of a buffer of water. So it's going to be able to look after it better. And this here, it's only got so much water. That you can that you can um, give to it, and that's the reason why you have to watch out for that, especially going on holiday. Whew, it's getting warm, isn't it, up here? <laughs> <laughs> um, just just a couple more questions. Yes. I haven't seen you using the shrub tough mix, and I would have probably thought, oh, tomatoes are vegetarian. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and for a tomato as that has. And that's 40 litres, that's 25 litres. So when you're feeding that, in, when you're feeding a shrub and tub bag in, in, um, in December, you'll be feeding that one as well in December. So the thing is, it's, it's, it's virtually the same, but the good thing about this one down here, the um, fruit and veggie mix, it's a very good filler. So if you've taken out, so, say you're doing your veggie garden, your raised bed, you want to scrap that much soil out, you know, because it's got weeds in it or, you know, it's not up to scratch, you scrap that out, put in your compost it away, and you, you top that up, because it's quite a, a lot of food, it's got a lot of feed, and it's going to give your vegetables a good start when you start growing it again. That's why it's mostly used. But tomatoes are a specialist crop, so that's why I like that one. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, you, no, you don't dig a deep hole. You, you fork it in quite deep. Yeah, yeah. But because because these tomatoes have got such vigorous root systems um, that you that, that you don't want. Sometimes, if, if I've seen it before when they say their tomatoes aren't doing very well, I've gone there and I'll scratch down. It's hit a pan, probably about that far down, and, and the tomatoes hit that and it's had nowhere to go. And so that's why you need to give it as much. As I said, by in another month, that would have hit the bottom. Those roots would have hit the bottom of that bag. Yes, ma'am. No. Oh, I'm talking about mostly for glass greenhouses. Um, what I would do if you've got a, if you, if you when it's outside, I, I don't think they get so many of those pests. Personally, in my opinion, but in the greenhouse, because it's warmer and you've had them started earlier, they, the pests seem to get in there a lot easier. And um, the other thing you can use, which is, thanks for mentioning it, um, we're talking about pests. I had these, um, they're little yellow tapes and they're sticky tapes. They don't look very pretty. Oh, is it down there, is it? Oh, no one, I couldn't see it. Had a girl's look. Nah. <laughs> Ooh, look at these looks. These are really, really quite good because they're yellow and they attract flying insects. And... Um, very good in greenhouses. We actually put them up in our house plant areas because we have problems with um, aphids, white fly, all those flying insects, and they stick to it. Also, very good for psyllids as well. The psyllid flies around there and sticks to it because they're attracted to the yellow. And um, excellent for, for deterring pests. No, no. Yes, you can. Yep, you can. But that's just another form of, of, of um, keeping your bugs off, off your plants. But your neem granules generally do that, and that feeds and gets rid of your, your, your problems at the same time. Yes? Is there any plants or vegetables that you should, should not grow next year? Uh, Daily nightshade? <laughs> Hemlock? <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm being, I'm being facetious. Sorry, what did you say? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I, I grow tomatoes and potatoes quite comfortably close by side, side by side. The only thing is that you're probably going to have more of attraction to the psyllid when you have them both, both to their, together. Yes, yeah. But I, 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 I mean, most of us only have small gardens, so if, you, if you're happy growing your potatoes, grow your potatoes next to your tomatoes. I don't think it's a problem. They're both members of the Slaman family, um, but um, no, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't, no. Yes, you can, easily. Yep. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry, I was just being a bit smart before, so. Just trying to have a laugh, it's all right, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, so um, absolutely, um, grow anything you want, where you want, it's all good. Oh, gosh, we've gone 10 minutes over, but we started 10 minutes late anyway, so um, just quickly a couple more questions, if there's any. Well, cucumber, what about cucumber? How close? So long as you give them room. So long as you give them room. Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. Yeah, so long as they don't compete with light. Because you, 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 no, you can grow your cucumbers and, and your um, tomatoes side by side. Right, just, <coughs> just quickly, um, in this magazine here, we've got a new tomato out called Grape Fine, I think it is, Grape Fine. They're a wee bit small at the moment. Um, but the thing is, they'll be released by, hopefully by Labor Weekend. Um, there's a new cucumber out too, but the cucumbers, again, um, are, a, are a crop that grow 
very much like these. There's a window to grow them in, and you've got to get them in now, really, really quickly. What a fantastic crowd you've been. And look, I mean, if you haven't, if you have had problems, or you continue having problems, speak to me, because tomatoes can give you a lot of pleasure. They're a lot of fun to grow. And um, there's those simple things, the 101 of growing tomatoes of what, what we've just been talking about. And I want you to have every success with these, peppers, everything. And that's the reason why we grow them. We know it's good. So that's why we sell them like that. Okay, thank you, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>